Welcome to Outlaws and Gunslingers. From the Wild West to the rise of organized crime during the Prohibition, all the way up to today, America has had criminals, gangs, and law enforcement trying to bring them down. Join us as we profile some of the most infamous criminals, gangsters, outlaws, and lawmen in American history. True crime like you've never heard it before. Ladies and gentlemen, here are your hosts, Bang and Dang. Welcome back to Outlaws and Gunslingers, which hosts Bang and Dang, and we are... On the last Tuesday of the month, which means it's serial killer time. And we falsely, well, I guess not we, but history has falsely claimed Triple H, H.H. H. Holmes, as America's first serial killer. But eh, eh, not to be the case. Not at all. Today we're going way, way back. Probably the earliest episode, I mean, probably the earliest time frame you'll ever see us do an episode on. Which is during the... Well, Really, right after the Revolutionary War, but we're going all the way back to the 1700s to look at probably the earliest documented serial killers in a United States history before, well, I guess they were technically the United States by the time they started killing, but they uh, did not like Americans and were loyal to the British crown. Yeah, they were mountain men, too. They were mountain men. It's kind of like a uh, wrong turn. Highwaymen and river pipe. Well, mountain men is... There you go. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about Makaja. They call him Big Harp. He was born Joshua Harper and Wiley Little Harp, who was born William Harper, who, um, after the war went on a killing spree, literally killing anybody for this is why they're believed to be serial killers because they didn't kill for money or robbery or anything. They literally did it for fun because mm. they could, because right. they were assholes. But um, you'll see some gory I mean, little shit that they done, too. 1700s in the mountains. I think you can pretty much do whatever you want. Right. Well, it was just the mountains. They're all in Illinois and everything. So, as you see. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll get to them. Before we do, you already know the drill. Go check out our YouTube if you're listening on Spotify, Apple. If you're listening on Spotify, Apple, go check out our YouTube I mean, <laughs> wait, <laughs> if you're Whoa. listening on YouTube, go check out our Spotify, Apple, whatever one you want to listen on, and give us a subscription, rate us, give us a review, and share us with your friends, and uh, yeah, just follow our Darts channel that we have on YouTube as well, all the links will be in the description, American murderers, highwaymen, and river pirates are these big and little harp, they operated in Tennessee, Kentucky, Illinois, and Mississippi in the late 18th century. They often, like I said, earliest documented serial killers in United States history. Loyal to the British Crown during the American Revolution, the Harps became outlaws after the war and began robbing and killing settlers in the remote frontier west of the Appalachian Mountains. They're believed to have killed 39 people, possibly as many as 50. Mm. Historians have noted the difficulties of differentiating this problem when you go far back right. uh, between facts and subsequent legends of the Harps and their exploits, as there are a few reliably certain records of their lives from the time period, though. A lot of this history comes from uh, old frontiersmen and right. settlers that were around and right. got passed down. I'm sure there's some kind of paper trail on these guys. Oh, uh, Makaja, they call Big Harp. He was probably born in or around uh, 1748. And they called him Joshua Harper. Wiley, his little brother, was born probably 1750, maybe later part, 1749. He was called William Harper. But wait, are they brothers? Oh, Though many accounts identify the two as brothers, it is also possible they were just cousins named Joshua and William Harper, who emigrated from Scotland in 1759 or 1760. According to this theory, their fathers were uh, brothers John and William Harper, who settled in Orange County, North Carolina, between 1761 and 1763. It is worth noting that I found some accounts of these guys that uh, Big Harper was born in 1778. Or no, it was 17. 68, and then the other one was born in 1770, but all their crimes take place um, in like the eight 80s, so that would make them like fucking 15. I don't think that's happening. But this is probably right. 48 and 50, not I'm guessing. 68 and 70. Right. That's a little young. He's about 30 years old. Yeah, it makes sense. Like many Scottish settlers of American colonies. But wait, they were killed in 1799. Yeah. That would have been 40, 50. I don't 50. think they were that, that, that old. Maybe they were born in 70. So, yeah, see, Wikipedia has Big Harp in 1768 and the other little one in 1770. 
But then another one had him in 48 and 50. Yeah, that was just a typo. Mm, definitely. So he was aged 31 to 51 in 1799. So, yeah, they... Yeah, they don't know. Uh, yeah, 68? So that's probably 1748. Before 19, 1768, probably 1748. He was born in Scotland, the kingdom of Great Britain. Or he was born in Orange County Province of North Carolina. Right, we don't know. So he either died between the age of 31 and 51 or when all this stuff is happening. So take it for a grain of salt, guys. Either they chucked his head off. <laughs> either or. Oh, yeah. That's not even the worst of it. But, yeah. Either or they're killers. <laughs> right. The killers. Well, yeah. they're Scottish settlers, too. And just like all the other Scottish or many of them, the settlers of American colonies, the Harpers were Calvinists. And they avowed you know, Scottish Tories people can't say, loyal uh, to the king. Purple burglar alarm. Yeah. Scottish people can't say purple burglar alarm with their accent. The I say it's, purple burglar alarm. It's um, physically impossible for like the ones with the thick accents. They can't, they cannot say it at all. Purple burglar alarm. Purple burglar alarm. That's probably what they sound like. It's hilarious. <laughs> That's cool. Good for them. But yeah, anyways. <laughs> this, is, this is a little fact for you guys. Anyways. Yeah. Just like many Scottish settlers again of the American colonies, <laughs> the harbors were Calvinists. And avowed Tories loyal to the king. What the fuck is Tories? A Tory is a loyal group to the king, man, clearly. They, like, fought against the American patriots. They were, like, tribes of fucking individual who supports political philosophy known as Toryism, based on a British version of... Yeah, they just... They, right. they love Britain. Right. They uh, love God, king, and country. Right. Or queen. Uh, God saved queen. Um, prior to the American Revolution, Big and Little Harp's fathers may have served in Tory militias in the War of the Regulation or the Regulator War, which was from 65 to 71, Damn. during which colonists in the Carolina took up arms against the continuing royal government interference by British colonial officials. Oh. When the Revolutionary War began, the Harps' father tried to join the Patriot American forces, but were denied due to earlier associations with British right. royalists. Right. You can't. Come on, guy. Yeah. The negative treatment of the Harp family by hostile Patriot neighbors may have contributed to Big and Little Harp's feelings of persecution as children and their desire for revenge against people they considered rebellious traitors, but who were still the British subjects of King George III. Oh. They're like, you guys are traitor, right. and King George is my king. Yeah, you sons of Pussies. bitches. Wow. Get out of here, then. Go back to fucking Britain or right. Scotland. Right. Well, reportedly, after some time, political tensions between the Harp family and local Patriots had escalated drastically culminated in an attack on the family home by local revolutionaries, which the boys witnessed the lynching of their parents. Oh. Upon seeing this, the Hart boys are said to have fled into the forest and hid for a while before they were found and rescued by members of the renegade band of the Chickamauga Cherokee. After being brought into the tribe, the boys realized they had similar beliefs as their new native caretakers. They hated the fucking white men. <laughs> right. And they learned how to properly hunt from the Indians, how to properly trap, and how to dress wild game and forage on native plants, as well as how to steal livestock, raid properties, and various methods to best torture and kill enemies. Oh, the oh, Indians shit. knew about that. You ain't kidding. Around April, May 1775, the young Harps left North Carolina and went to Virginia to find overseer jobs, overseer jobs on a slave plantation. Oh, wow. Big Harp later traveled in the company of two women who were Susan and Betty Roberts, possibly sisters, both of whom bore him children. Oh, wow. Little Harp married Sarah Sally Rice, the daughter of a Baptist minister. We'll get into that a little bit later. And how fucked up Big Harp is, which you guys will see a little bit later as well. Damn. It is crazy. Little is known of the Harp's precise whereabouts at the outbreak of the American Revolution. According to an eyewitness account by Captain James Wood of the Continental Army, they joined a Tory a rape gang in North Carolina. Oh, shit. These predatory, violently loyalist criminals took advantage of the general wartime lawlessness by beating and raping, raping and stealing and torturing and murdering all who they did not take kindly to, as well as burning and destroying property, especially the farms of Patriot colonists. Of course. Damn. The Harps' gang took part in the kidnapping of three teenage girls, with a fourth girl being rescued by Captain Wood himself. Oh, shit. The Harps also served as military associators, although they were not provided soldiers' uniforms, weapons, or pay by the British government. Like many other Loyalist volunteers, they survived via hunting, foraging, robbery, and through the looting of corpses on the battlefield. Oh, shit. Captain Woods' son was Frank Wood, who was a Patriot soldier of the Overmountain Men Frontier Group, and the older brother of Susan Wood, who, we'll find out later, was kidnapped and made the wife of uh, old Big Harp. Oh, wow. Yeah. Damn, Frank Wood, he claimed to have seen the Hart brothers serving loosely as Tory militia 
at the Battle of King's Mountain in October of 1780 under British Commander Major uh, Patrick Ferguson. There in a three-hour engagement, Wood, take, Wood took aim at Big Heart but missed the target. Mm. Later, he want to kill that motherfucker. Right. Later, the harp served under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Banister Tarleton's British Legion at the battles of uh, Blackstocks in November 8, 1780, and the battles of Cowpens, January 1781. Right. Following the decisive British defeat by the Patriot and French forces at Yorktown in 1781, the harps left North Carolina, dispersing with their Native American allies, which were the Chickamauga Cherokee. They went to Tennessee villages west of the Appalachian Mountains. April 2nd, 1781, they joined the war party of 400 Chickamauga and attacked the Patriot Frontier Settlement of Bluff Station at Fort Nashboro, which is present-day Nashville, Tennessee. Repeating the assault several months later on either July 20th, 1788, or April 9th, 1793. Wow. They did that again. Well. So they liked attacking with the Indians. Good for them. Right. After they did the raid, the Harps did not stay with the Cherokees long. About the first week of June, they kidnapped Maria, uh, Maria Davidson. A week later, they took Susan Wood. Yeah. After rendezvousing at a hunter's cabin on the east side of the mountains, the Harps, their captive and brutalized women, and four assistants, they crossed the mountains. During the 20-day trip to the Cherokee, Chickamauga, a uh, town of Nickajack, <laughs> located just southwest of modern-day Chattanooga, the Harps managed to find time to kill Moses Doss. Big Harp, he apparently found a problem with Doss's uh, over-concern for the women's well-being. Well, what do you expect? For the next 12 to 13 years, the women and the Harps stayed in the Indian 12 village. to 13 years doing nothing. Right. And then in September 1794, the American Patriots wiped out the Nickajack Indians. No, I pissed them off there. Uh, somehow the Harps just found out about the attack through their white contacts and secreted their women out of the village the night before the battle. Bitches, they couldn't even tell their people that they've been staying right. with for 13 years. That's bullshit. Uh, they took their wives on a nearly two-day journey, and they found a new camp where the women stayed for nine months. Oh. During which the Harps' pillaged and foraged, foraged in the more settled portions of Tennessee, such as Powell's Valley, close to Knoxville. They may have disguised their Tory pass from their patriot neighbors by changing their original name of Harper to Harpy. Uh, Harper was a common loyalist surname in Revolutionary War era North Carolina. Right, right. right. So the whereabouts are the Harps are unknown from the summer of 1795 to the spring of 1797. Okay. When that time they were apparently dwelling in a cabin on Beavers Creek near Knoxville. June 1st, 1797, Wiley, which is Little Harp, married Sarah Rice, who was a local girl. Uh, that is actually recorded in the Knox County marriage record. No so shit. We know that for a fact. Oh, that's nice. Well, sometime there in 1797, the Harps began a vicious crime spree through Tennessee, Kentucky, and Illinois. The Harps later. That boy, was it vicious! All right. The Harps later confessed to the murders of a uh, confirmed thirty-nine people, but the estimated combined total, including unknown victims, may number to fifty, as we said earlier. They are alleged to have butchered anyone at the slightest provocation, regardless of age, including babies. Oh yep. shit! What follows are the accounts of but a few of the murders the Harps committed. Seventeen ninety-seven. They lived on a farm eight miles west of the village of Beaver Creek until late seventeen ninety-eight. When a neighbor rightfully accused the Harps of stealing his horses. Can't do that. Harps ran off, but the neighbors eventually caught up with them and the horses. As they made their way back to the capital, the Harps escaped. For a while, the neighbors pursued, but eventually gave up. Well, rather than hiding like normal people would do, that same night, the Harps returned to a rowdy groggery, oh. which was operated by a man named Hughes a few miles west of Knoxville. The Harps had frequented the establishment before and knew the operator. All right. Inside, they found a man named Johnson for whom they were looking for, hmm. or who knows why. He may have been the man who enlightened the Harps' neighbors about the horse's whereabouts. Right. The Harps just took and killed him. Some days later, a passerby found his body floating in the Holstein River, ripped open and filled with stones. Oh, no. Which would later become a trademark of a Harp victim. Jeez. The Harps got away with that murder in part because authorities believed the establishment's owner and his brothers-in-law who were present that night, had something to do with it. Really? Look at that. She's okay. falsely accused. Huh? Damn. After being kicked out of Knoxville, damn, the Harps fled north. They went to Kentucky. They entered a state on the Wilderness Road near the Cumberland Gap. They are believed to have murdered a peddler named Peyton, taking his horse and some of his goods. Not all of them, just some of them. December, they murdered two travelers from Maryland named Paca and Bates. Next, they killed a man named John Langford, who was a man foolish enough to travel the wilderness alone and show off his silver coin into many inns. He's like, well, check this shit that, out. Guy. Check this shit out. 
Like Johnson, they failed to dispose of the body well enough, and passing drovers discovered it a couple days later. Almost immediately, the nearby innkeeper recognized the body and figured out the culprits. Those damn harps. Harps. A posse gathered, and the chase began. Christmas Day, 1799, they caught the harps and imprisoned them in Stanford, Kentucky. Preliminary hearing on January 4th found them e- found enough evidence for a trial and ordered that the prisoners be taken to the district court at Danville, Kentucky. All right, for the next two months, the Harps plotted their escape, which came on March 16th. Oh, wow. They left the women in the jail for practical reasons. First of all, they were all three were pregnant. Oh, shit. And by the time the district court freed the women in April, all three had given birth. Oh, wow. Each child two months apart in age. After their escape, the Harps continued their murder spree. Late March or early April, they killed a man uh, near the future site of Edmonton, followed by another murder on the Barren River eight miles below Bowling Green. Oh, shit. April 10th, they killed the 13-year-old son of Colonel Daniel Trabu, oh, man. who lived three miles west of present Columbia, Kentucky. Ironically, posse members chasing the Harps were at Trabu's house, urging him to join the chase when they discovered Trabu's son missing and believed him abducted by, Holy by the Harps. Shit. These guys are like right there. Yeah. Damn. While fleeing northward, the Harps killed two men named Edmonton and Stump. When they were near the mouth of the Saline River in southern Illinois, they came upon three men and camped there. Murdered them as well. <laughs> Why not? The pair then made their way to Cave in Rock, which was a natural cave on the bluffs above the Illinois bank of the Ohio River, which was a stronghold of the river pirate and criminal gang leader Samuel Mason. Oh. Well, a posse had been aggressively pursuing them, but stopped just short of the cave on the opposite shore in Kentucky. They're like, we ain't going. Uh-uh. You guys heard of uh, Samuel Mason? New, new, new. Uh, with their wives and three children in tow, the Harps held up with Samuel Mason and company, who preyed on slow-moving flatboats making their way along the Ohio River, which makes yeah. sense. After one of those attacks, the pirates threw an impromptu celebration inside the cave. Seeing, only sur- seeing the only survivor alive to tell the tale of the attack, the Harps developed a fiendish idea for entertainment. With the others drunk in their reverie, the Harps took the survivor up to the top of the cliff. Oh, wow. They stripped him naked, tied him to a horse, blindfolded the horse, and ran it off the cliff. Oh, no. Come on, guys. Holy shit. Suddenly, the outlaws in the cave became aware of terrified screams, hoofbeats, and clatter of dislodged rocks. They ran out of the cave. They could see the horse's neck extended, its legs galloping frantically against the thin air, and tied to its back was a naked, screaming prisoner. They just so happened to come out as soon as the horse was galloping off the cliff. Right, and he had a stark horror look on his face. Mm. In an instant, horse and man were dashed against the rocks. That uh, W.D. Snively Jr., he wrote that in his book of Satan's Ferrymen. Wow. This event proved to the pirates that harps, they had to go. They ordered them to leave and take their women and children with them. Even the damn pirates were like, these guys are fucking right. too brutal for us. Oh, holy shit. Jeez. The Harps then returned to eastern Tennessee where they continued their vicious murder spree. Well, they killed a farmer named Bradbury, also a man named Hardin, and a boy named Coffee in July of 1798. Oh, why? Soon more bodies were discovered, including William Ballard, who had been disemboweled and thrown in the Holston River. Jeez. July 29th, they came across James and Robert Brassel on the road near Brassel's Knob. Then it'd be a posse members looking for the Harps. The Harps turned against the Brassels, accusing them of being the Harps. <laughs> oh, no. And then uh, Robert escaped and went for help. And with him gone, the Harps beat James to death. Son Why would he leave his brother? Bitch. He probably told him, go get help. That's Don't worry about me. Right. Damn. These guys are brutal. As they headed toward Kentucky, they killed another man, John Tully, around the beginning of August in what is now Clinton County, Kentucky. And Mr. John Graves and his teenage son were also found dead. Each having been bludgeoned wow. with an axe. Son of a Jeez, bitch. Dude. South Central Kentucky. That's, That's where they found those bodies. Uh, in Logan County, Kentucky, the Harps killed a young girl as well as a young slave and an entire family they found asleep in a camp. Such a fucking cocksuckers. <laughs> August 1799, a few miles northeast of Russellville, Kentucky, Big Harp bashed his infant daughter's head against a tree because he was annoyed by her constant crying. Damn. His only crime for which he later stated that uh, he would feel general remorse over. Wow. Oh, look at this guy. The following day, the Harps left to meet their wives at a rendezvous. While riding good horses that morning, they met up with James Tompkins, who was a local resident. Good horses. Tompkins huh? had not met the man before and uh, believed their tale of being itinerant preachers. Oh, shit. The local man invited them home for midday supper, where Big Harp presided over with more than an aquatic meal blessing. Oh. He pretended, didn't he? Ironically, during the conversation, Tompkins admitted that he had no more gunpowder for his gun. 
Oh, shit. And a show of charity, Big Heart poured a teacup full of his powder horn from his powder horn. Three days later, that powder would be used to shoot Big Harp in the back as he tried to escape. Whoa! Leaving Tompkins' place in peace, the Harps traveled on to the house of Silas McBee, who was a local justice of the peace. Wow, they didn't kill this guy, huh? No, but because of McBee's aggressive guard dogs, they decided against an attack on McBee. Okay, I wonder why they left this guy. Because he was like... Inviting him for food. It was probably right. nice. He was an old man. Bag. Well, they decided against that very attack, so they uh, traveled to a home of an acquaintance, Moses Stiegel. Moses, he wasn't home, but his wife offered them a bed to sleep, and as long as they didn't mind a third man, Major William Love, who had arrived earlier. So like, like, Y'all got to sleep in the same bed together. <laughs> like, I got another guy stopped in earlier. If you're more than welcome. Yeah, crazy. People just stop at your house randomly. Go, it's the night. Right. <laughs> you got to feed them, and right. water, and all that shit. They're like, you know what? We'll accept. But then later that night, they murdered Love, the Major General. Mrs. Stiegel. And the seagull's four-month-old baby boy. Oh, well, all rumor, of them. Rumor has it that... Uh, oh, so wait. They accepted, but later that night, they killed Love, Mrs. Stiegel, and the four-month-old baby boy. Yeah, because rumor has it the four-month-old started crying, so he slit, they slit the throat. Oh, and then no. the mother walked in while they were doing it, started screaming, so they killed her. Well, they had to, right? My, well, they didn't have to. <laughs> they didn't have to do any of it. <laughs> right. Damn. Wow. The next morning, they burned down the house, hoping to attract the attention of McBee. The smoke did attract McBee and a number of others, obviously. obviously. By the next morning, the posse grew to include seven local residents. What do you think? This one dude's going to come check out a burning house? <laughs> uh, by the next morning, the posse grew to include seven local residents, including Stiegel himself. He didn't even know what the hell was oh, going on. Moses. All day, they followed the Harps Trail. At night, they camped and started again the next morning. That's what's August 24th. And they were like, let's roll. Let's keep on going. We don't care what date it is. <laughs> <laughs> While chasing the harps. I didn't even know. Right. While chasing the harps, they discovered two more victims of, uh, of the harps that were killed a few days before. Oh, that's so stupid. Well, the second governor of Kentucky, James Gerard, issued a government proclamation April 22nd, 1799. What's about fucking time? In the name of the Commonwealth of Kentucky, declaring a $300, Damn. which is about 7600 bucks today. And that was a reward for their apprehension and deliverance back to Danville, Kentucky, for trial. Oh. Governor Garrard gave a description of the physical appearances of the Harp brothers. Okay. Makaja Harp, alias Roberts, is about six feet high of robust make and is about 30 to 32 years old. He has an ill-looking, downcast countenance, and his hair is black and short, but comes very much down his forehead. I mean, pretty much when you see this guy, he's, right. you know, there's at least some trouble going on. He is built very straight and is full flesh in the face. When he went away, he had on a striped nankeen coat, dark blue woolen stockings, uh, leggings of drab cloth, and trousers of the same as the coat. Okay. Wiley Harp, alias Roberts, is very meager in his face, has short black hair, but not quite so curly as his brother's. He looks older, though really younger, and has likewise a downcast countenance. Hmm. He had on a coat of the same stuff as his brother's and had a, sh- a sir out coat over the close-bodied one. Okay. His stockings were dark woolen ones and his leggings of drab cloth. Dude, you know these dudes had to sweat like a son of a bitch. Dude, yes. It's all like, man. Baseball players. That's right. <laughs> Insanity. Well, the posse soon found the Harps camp with only little Harps wife's present. Oh, no. She pointed the way Big Harper and the other two women went. Four of the posse members shot at Harp. One hit him in the leg. John Laper missed and then borrowed Tompkins' gun for a second shot. Oh, Leaper then spurred his horse forward to catch up with Big Harp. Knowing, knowing that there hadn't been enough time for Leaper to reload his weapon, Harp turned and took careful aim at Leaper. Leaper. Then, using Tompkins' guns containing the powder given him by Harp just days before, Leaper fired his second round towards Harp, entering his backbone and damaging the spinal cord. Ooh. Damn. Well, Harp continued riding down the trail, losing more blood every minute. The posse caught up with him and pulled him from his horse without resistance. I bet. Begging for water, that means he's dying. Right. Uh, Leaper took one of Harp's shoes and filled it with full of water for him. Harp, confessing his sins, pulled Stiegel over oh, the edge. Oh, no. He took Harp's own butcher knife and slowly cut off the outlaw's oh. head. He placed it on a saddlebag, and the posse eventually put it in a tree where the road from Henderson forked into two directions, one to Marion and Eddyville and the other to Madisonville and Russellville. For years, that intersection took the name Harp's Head. No oh, shit. Gotta warn them. That's what happens, you fucking low-life bitches. You ain't kidding. Well, Little Harp, he successfully escaped. And he rejoined Mason Gang Pirates at Cave and Rock. He was like, my brother's not here. That was his idea, man. I'm showing you what. (laughs) Holy shit. Four years later, Wiley Harp, 
might have been captured along with the rest of the gang, but went unrecognized because he was using the alias John Sutton or John Sutton. All right. Both Harp and Samuel Mason, the gang leader, escaped, but Mason was shot. Oh, shit. Afterwards, Little Harp and another gang member, Peter Alston, who went by the name James May, son of counterfeiter Philip Alston, tried to claim the bounty on Samuel Mason, oh. although it is unclear whether Mason died from the wounds sustained during the escape or whether Harp killed him. Ooh. Regardless, as they presented Mason's head, a Kentuckian recognized Harp and Elson as outlaws, and and uh, they were arrested. Oh, you idiots. The two escaped, but were quickly recaptured, tried, and sentenced to be hanged. Oh, no. January 1804, Wiley Harp and Peter Olson were indeed executed by hanging. No shit. Their heads were cut off, placed high on stakes along the Natchez Trace as a warning to other outlaws. Oh. This is what happens when you come around here. Damn. Hell of a time in the early 1800s. Yeah, man. They late just, 1700s. They just did whatever they did. Holy shit. According to John Musgrave. Imagine they did that shit now. Oh. Killed people and then put their heads on spikes and shit. They too. might need to start doing that uh, again. Yeah, you would Fuck. think. Damn. According to John Musgrave, the Harp women, after being freed from cohabitation with the bros, led relatively respectable and normal lives. Uh, why not? I'm sure they're a little fucked up, but. Well, I mean, they were kidnapped. Right. Upon the death of uh, Big Harp. In Kentucky, the women were apprehended and taken to the Russellville, Kentucky State Courthouse, but they are later released. Sally Rice Harp went back to Knoxville to live in her father's house. For a time, Susan Wood and Maria uh, Maria Davidson, a.k.a. Betsy Roberts, they lived in Russellville together. Susan Wood remarried later, and then she died in Tennessee. Mm-hmm. Well, September 27, 1803, Betsy Roberts married John Huffstutler. <laughs> And the couple lived as tenants on Colonel Butler's plantation. They moved to Hamilton County, Illinois in 1828. Many children they had. They both eventually died in the 1860s. Ooh, they got to see Nation at War, huh? Mm, maybe. 1820, Sally Rice, who had remarried, traveled with her husband and father to their new home in Illinois via the cave in Rock Ferry. Look at that shit. All right. With the violence surrounding the vicious harps, it comes as no surprise that there is a ghostly legend attached to the notorious Big Harp. Oh, I bet. In addition to terrorizing the states of Kentucky, Tennessee, and Illinois, the harps were often known to have traveled along the Natchez Trace through Mississippi. Between Tupelo and Houston, Mississippi, there is a place called Witch Dance. Steeped in mystery for centuries, it was not only the home of the mound builders of Mississippi, but was also said to have been used by a coven of witches oh, who would gather for nighttime ceremonies. Oh, my. Lore has it that wherever the witches' feet touched the ground during their dances, the grass would either die or would wither and die, never to grow again. No shit. At some point prior to his death, Big Harp was traveling along the Natchez Trace with an Indian guide who showed him the bare spots in the ground and told him of the legend of the witch dance. Big Harp only scoffed at this and began to leap from spot to spot, daring the witches to come out and fight him. Uh-huh. Of course, nothing happened, at least not then. Eventually, Big Harp made his way back to Kentucky, where he was tracked down by the posse in August 1799. After he was decapitated and his head placed in the tree, the skull was said to have been removed by a witch, ground into powder, and used as a potion to heal a relative. Right. Word soon got around, and when the travelers retold the story along the trace, they would swear they could hear crackling laughter coming from the nearby bushes in the trees. <laughs> All right, well, anybody want to go to the Natchez Trail to see some creepy shit? <laughs> dude, witches were humongous back then, dude. Of course. Supposedly. Well, this is 100 years after the Salem Witch Trials. Right. This is insane. It's crazy. I never really thought much about it. <laughs> I mean, who just thinks about witches, but. Right. I mean, you see them at Halloween and all that, and that was actually how they portrayed them. They weren't really like that, though, but. Just normal people. Well, maybe. Normal people that did some fucking weird shit. Yeah. Crazy stuff, man. There's a lot of them. A lot. 1941 film, Devil and Daniel Webster. Or it's also called All That Money Can Buy. Big and Little Harp are part of the jury of the damned that Daniel Webster must convince in order to free an innocent Jabez Stone. 1956 Walt Disney television series, Davy Crockett and the River Pirates. The Harp brothers are portrayed by American actors Paul Newland as Big Harp and Frank Richards as Little Harp. 1975 Broadway musical, The Robber Bridegroom. Future two characters, Big Harp. said bridge too. <laughs> <laughs> Future two characters, Big Harp and Little Harp, but without the E. And they're supposedly based on the harps. Big harp is presented as a cut-off head in a trunk. Oh, well, clearly. Rescued by his brother when he was put to death for thieving. 
He also uh, the smarter of the two bros. Cool. The Hart brothers are the inspiration for the big and little drum in Lois McMaster's Bujold's 2008 novel Passage, part of the Sharing Knife series. Cool. Wiley Harp is also the subject of a song on Bob Frank and John Murray's 2006 album World Without End. Really? 2015, the Investigation Discovery television channel uh, series Evil Kin aired an episode about the Hart brothers called Something Wicked in the Woods. <laughs> All right. Short narrative of the Hart Brothers' lives appear in Salah Satterstrom's 2015 novel, Slab. Okay. In this uh, novel, Slab, Tiger, the novel's main character, she grows up with her family near the Mississippi River on the land of Wiley Harp's estate off the Natchez Trace, where Wiley Harp would dismember the corpse and make arrangements for their parts, ornamenting the land around this humble plantation. Tiger's grandfather installs a tire swing on a tree, to which he also affixes a historical plaque. Little Harp hanged here. All right. A book, The Blue Cloak, by Shannon McNear, was released in 2020, telling the story of the Harps with a focus on sailing. All right, cool. <laughs> That's all right. Other media for you guys. Right. But, uh, and others. Uh, I mean, uh, I'd like to get some more information on these guys. There's no more information. You got literally all the information there all right. is. Right. Damn, they cut their insides out and filled them with rocks. Yeah, idiots trying to submerge them in the water. And it didn't work. Obviously. Yeah, look at that, guys. Uh, who knows how much of it's actually true, I guess we supposedly. Good. That's I mean, a good folk tale, right? There's no government records of any Just of the these. marriage. Just the marriage. There's marriage, right? There's no government records of... There's no... Uh, there's got to be court cases. As far as I know, there's nothing in the courts. Mm, really? So, uh, yeah, so take it with what you, uh, what you want, but they are generally considered the first documented serial killers in the United States history, so. And that they were, some fucking grizzly little guys, huh? Good for them, though. Now, that's a serial killer, just because. What do they call that one? Impulsive? Mm -hmm. What are they, what are, we had the thing right. in the beginning. I mean, most of them have a. They just, what do they call them, a spree killer? Anger, thrill seeking, yeah, thrill seeking. That's what they were. Yeah, probably thrill seeking and, and anger. attention seeking. Uh, maybe anger. attention seeking. I think it was anger, thrill seeking. Uh, yeah, those two. Yeah. So, well, that was the Hart Brothers for uh, that. These guys were brutal. They sure were. Next Son week, I don't know what they did in when they were living with the Indians for all those years. Probably. Well, even they, worse. They, dude. Said they taught them how to right. rape and. Uh, Pillage and so there's probably more. Torture. There's probably more people. Yeah, but that, that serial killing then, or it's kind of, yeah, because it's a group of people. Right. So, uh, an attack. Right. Well, next week we're moving on to mafia, and then uh, we'll head into uh, more Hell's Angels after that. So make sure you're stayed right here on this channel. So make sure you're checking out our description or the links in the description. Just give us subscriptions <laughs> and uh, follow <laughs> us, review all that good stuff. We'll be back next week. We are the Mother Michiganders. We bang dang, right? <laughs>